Hi everybody, welcome to the next topic. So last time we started into the four practices of effective helpers. The first effective practice, the first practice of effective helpers was caring for others. We talked about how you can deliberately cultivate compassion. This week we're going to be talking about the next practice of effective helpers, which is they are really good at mastering problems. Now, the reason we're talking about this is because many problems are hard to solve. If they were easy to solve, they would already be taken care of. And because they're hard to solve, we need expertise to solve them. So I want to spend some time in this session talking about expertise and how it's developed and how we can apply that idea to helping behavior. I want to begin by introducing the apprentice model, which for most of human history, much of human history, and much of human history anyway, the apprenticeship was how we transferred expertise. What would happen is if you wanted to gain mastery in a specific profession, you wouldn't go to school for it. You would instead apprentice with a master in that field. So here we have a cobbler teaching, a master cobbler teaching an apprentice cobbler how to make shoes. And, uh, and this was a very common model for a lot of human history about transferring expertise. We would get expertise by basically t turning this master of the field into into our teacher, and then we would become the ongoing live-in full-time student. And a lot of that expertise in the apprenticeship model doesn't just come from instruction, but it also comes from getting your hands engaged in the actual activity. So you're doing the thing, not just learning about the thing. It's a model of exper uh, expertise transfer that has changed a lot, especially in the last century or so where we now do classroom learning much more frequently rather than apprenticeship. And, and we're, we're moving kind of back in that direction at the university level because you're seeing more and more experiential learning becoming a thing in universities. And it's in part because we lost in the, in the, in the classroom-based model, we've lost a lot of the benefits of apprenticeship. Well, this metaphor of apprenticeship is one that I want you to keep in mind as we go through this session. But instead of thinking, how do I apprentice with a master problem solver? Instead, I want you to think of it as apprenticing with the problem itself and letting the problem become your teacher. Now, in the Ballard Center um, for Social Impact at BYU, where we teach students how to solve social problems, we use this phrase with our students and we tell them to love the problem. And what we mean by that is be enamored with and fascinated by the problem you're trying to solve instead of being enamored by the solution that you think is so cool. You see this all the time where people think this solution to a problem is so fascinating, amazing, and, and the solution ends up letting them down because the problem is typically much more complex than they realize. And so instead of becoming enamored with the the solution become enamored with the problem that you're trying to fix. So this is going to be a session about mastery and learning how to master problems using this sort of a framework of apprenticeship that we were talking about. So let's talk a little bit about how people master things. Well, one of the things that we know is that when human beings are learning about complex topics, they form what are called schemas. Sometimes they're called schematas. But the idea is we develop a mental structure for pulling together elements of a complex idea. All of you look at this. I don't have the word elephant on this slide, but all of you looked at this image and immediately knew it was an elephant. If we were to get into your brain and, and pull out the schema of elephant, and then we were to analyze what it is that made you know, just at first glance, that this was an elephant, we would see components of your schema there making up the schema of elephant. So you, you has a tail that looks like this, and ears that look like this, a trunk, legs that look like this. And, and this is what indicates to you that it's an elephant, that the, the mental model of an elephant is a schema. What we know is that experts use better schemas than novices. They immerse themselves enough with a, with a topic that they understand it with a level of depth and sophistication, that they have more schemas relative to the topic and more intricate schemas relative to the topic. And so I would show this to you guys and you'd all say it was an elephant, but what if I asked you, is it an African or a, an Indian elephant? 
I doubt any of you know. I don't even know. <laughs> and I, I mean, because we we don't really have tusks obviously represented here. The size of the ears, I think, make a difference between an African or an Indian elephant. I think the length of the tail also makes a difference. So there's actual physiological differences between different species of elephant. And yet here we have, or I think they're all the same species maybe. I don't even know that. <laughs> so my schemas around elephants are obviously not at the expert level. But if we got a biologist in who studied elephants, they would have much more sophisticated schemas baked into their brain that they've developed over time that, uh, can, that can get into greater nitty-gritty and understanding about elephants. So experts use sophisticated, more efficient, uh, more detailed, and, 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 and greater number of these schemas than non-experts have. These schemas are often developed through a process of practice and improvement. You guys read the article from HBR by uh, Dr. Erickson. He was one of the leading researchers in how people develop expertise and gain mastery in something. I'm pulling out a few elements uh, that I want to highlight. There's more to this, but these are the ones that are relevant to our topic today. Uh, expertise only is gained by working on what you don't do well. Doing the thing you're already good at over and over again is not going to get you to expertise. You have to do the thing, you have to do the stuff that you're not good at. So this would be studying the topics that are hard for you rather than the ones that are easy for you. Um, regularly receiving feedback is part of practice and improvement. And so having a teacher or a master or some other expert who can guide you in your learning process and also then teaching you how to get feedback for yourself. And so even a self-instructive model of practice can achieve this feedback loop that you need for improving. And then you have to practice in a way that fits the domain. So you're going to do different kind of practice for getting good at golf than you would getting good at the piano, than you would getting good at calculus. And so developing expertise across all these different domains has to involve practice in a way that's specific to or fitting the domain. So this is another way we develop expertise is doing the things on this slide. And then expertise culminates in what we would call tacit knowledge. And this was an idea developed by a chemist slash philosopher named Dr. Michael Polanyi. And Polanyi has this phrase that, that, uh, that is, is cited a lot, which is, we know more than we can tell. In his philosophy, one of the things he focused on was epistemology, which is the study of knowledge, like how do we know things? And, uh, and what he sort of made this really compelling argument for is that a lot of our expertise or our knowledge of things is ineffable, meaning hard to explain, and it's often unique to the expert. So a lot of expertise is developed in a way that it's hard to put into words for the expert. They might have a hard time transmitting it because the knowledge was developed in a way that created tacit knowledge, the kind that's sort of inherent to doing the, the, the thing, mastering the thing in a way that you can't easily teach to somebody who hasn't put in the work to become an expert. And so this deliberation and experience is what produces tacit knowledge. And, uh, and that's a, a, another layer of how expertise works. I do want to emphasize, though, that mastery in a given field has pretty limited reach. And what I mean by that is being good at one thing does not necessarily make you good at another thing or or, or, or your expertise has low portability. And I want to illustrate it, and this is based on some really interesting research done in the 60s. I want to show you how portability has, how expertise has low portability. So in a moment here, I'm going to show you a, a chess board, like the game of chess. I'm going to show you a board, and on the board, you're going to see a position that represents a game that's sort of halfway through. So a game was started, we're taking a snapshot of that game halfway through, the, halfway through, and so you're going to see white and black pieces on the board, um, sort of like mid-game, okay? But I'm only going to show this for five seconds. So when I show you the board, I'm going to count down, I won't do it verbally, but I'm going to count down to five seconds, and then I'm going to make it disappear. In those five seconds, I want you to memorize as many chess piece positions as possible. So if you see a pawn, I want you to remember where it is, if it's a white or black pawn, what square it's on. And I want you to try to remember within five seconds as many positions, as many pieces, and where they are on the board as you can. Okay? So you ready? Here we go. Okay, time's up. Now, if that felt way too quick, 
<laughs> I understand it's supposed to feel quick. So now that we have the board here, and you can ignore that I actually, uh, the, the board should be flipped, so that already complicates things. But um, uh, but I want you to try to place the, the pieces on the board, okay? Now, if I were to give you time to do this, uh, and you could even pause if you actually want to do the exercise, um, you, well, I'll show you in a minute like the predicted accuracy that you would have. I'm going to do it one more time, though. So let's do another one, okay? So I'm going to show you another board. I'm going to show you it for five seconds, and then I want you to try to recreate the piece positions on the board, okay? But you only have five seconds to look at it, starting now. Okay, time's up. I'll let you pause the video if you want to try to recreate those positions again. You're welcome to do that, or you can just keep watching, and I'll show you why I was doing this. So here's the fun, fascinating thing that has come out of research related to this. I'm assuming none of you are chess experts. If you are and you haven't told me this, I'm disappointed because I like following chess. Like competitive chess is really fascinating to me. And I try to pay attention to who's doing well in the big tournaments and everything. But uh, I'm not very good myself. I'm, a, a, you know, I'm maybe an above average player, but the average is, is pretty low <laughs> in terms of expertise. Like thinking about my rating on chess.com. Anyway, it's not great. But if... Uh, if, if, if you are a novice player like me and you're given this task, that first board that I showed you, you'd probably be able to recreate it with about a 5 to 15% accuracy, meaning like of the piece positions, the, the getting the right pieces, the right color of pieces in the right positions, you do with about 5 to 15% accuracy. However, if we picked a, an expert, an expert in chess, expert like being an expert in chess is not just like a, a vague definition. There's actually like a rank based on how competitive you are playing other players that qualifies you for an expert level position, either at the national or international level. So being a chess expert means you're far, far, far above the abilities of the average person. And so you can be an expert and then a master and then a grandmaster and so forth. But if you take a chess expert, so somebody who's objectively identified as an expert, they can take the same board with five seconds of looking at it and recreate it with about 80% accuracy. Isn't that fascinating? So same five seconds, they can look at this board and they can recreate it with a much higher degree of accuracy than average people like us. Now, the reason that's true is because of schemas. When a chess expert is looking at this board, they're not looking at it and sort of, you know, trying to identify each piece. Instead, they see patterns, they see schemas. And they're just trying to remember the schemas not the individual chess positions. So they pull the schema out that says, oh, I remember the rooks and the king were positioned this relative way, and I've played a game where that happened before. And that move makes sense. In fact, part of their schemas informed are going to be formed based on threats and next moves. So they'll see this board, and they'll think, oh, black just moved, so white is moving next, and the best move for white is this. They can process that really quickly because of their practice in this domain of, of knowledge. But the second board I showed you, again, you'd probably recreate it with about 5 to 15% accuracy. But a chess expert would probably produce, reproduce it with the same level of accuracy. Now, what's the difference between the first board and the second one? Why is such a dramatic gap in performance here? Well, because the second board is not the result of a game. This is me randomly placing pieces haphazardly on the board so that it's not the result of a regular game of chess. So the patterns that exist here would not be reflected in the schemas that a chess expert would have. If a chess expert looked at this board, they wouldn't be able to draw upon their schemas because this is not a position that's produced from playing the game and developing expertise. This is a nonsense position. In fact, I'll tell you a bunch of reasons it's a nonsense position. At the very top on the eighth rank, you see there's a white pawn that hasn't been converted to any other piece. Why you would trade in a pawn for a pawn, I don't know. You have two bishops that are both on black squares. Every chess game, each player gets a white uh, bishop and, and a black, it's green squares here, but you get the idea. Like there's a bishop that runs on all the white squares and a bishop that runs on all the dark squares. And you don't get two bishops on the same color of squares. This board has two kings that are for the black position which again is a nonsense position. You just don't get that. And then on the board, there are a bunch of like nonsense threats. Like there are, are 
pieces that can be taken without thread, with, you know, without having to trade anything. Like there are a bunch of nonsense threats. And also in this position, you've got a check going on where the white queen on h2 is threatening the king on, uh, on f4. Anyway, the point of all that is to say, like, this is a nonsense position. And when an expert sees this and gets five seconds to memorize the board, they're going to struggle to memorize it because they because it's not a game produced by natural play. And so they don't have schemas that help them remember the board position. So fascinating stuff, right? And this is just within the domain of chess. The reality is, is that expertise is very domain specific and domains are usually very narrow where even somebody who's an expert in chess can't transfer it to a nonsense position on the board. But within the within you know a regularly played game of chess, they can have incredible recall. In fact, there's this really fun video of Magnus Carlsen who's been the many times over world champion in chess at, at different levels of like, you know, speed or classical chess. And, uh, and Magnus Carlsen, like in this cool video, the interviewer is showing him positions of, uh, from games like midway through. And Magnus Carlsen can not only recreate the positions, he can tell you what the game was, meaning he can say, oh, this was the, this was the, uh, the uh, Kasparov game from 1998. <laughs> just by looking at the position like that's the level of expertise he has it's pretty amazing but it's confined to chess and actually there's interesting research that shows that a bunch of the stuff we think makes us better at other things doesn't make us better being good at chess doesn't make you better at other things it just makes you good at chess the same is true for music and all these other skills now i want to be clear about one thing the expertise in the domain is pretty non-transferable it's 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 hard to get into other area, other domains but the skills to developing expertise can be useful and portable right being good at practicing for example can make you good at lots of things because practice is what makes you get better and so the skills required to become a chess, chess expert to become a virtuoso violinist to become a world-class tennis player the skills that get you to that level of, of mastery those skills are pretty portable it turns out and so you can know one problem, and getting back to helping, you can know one specific problem really, really well, but then you could completely misunderstand a related but distinct problem where you look at a situation, you say, oh, it's this, but you could be totally off because your expertise doesn't translate to the next, to the next adjacent problem. It also, expertise doesn't compensate for what's called inattentional blindness. You guys may have encountered this idea before. There's a, a video that was viral a while back where there were a bunch of uh, people, a uh, black team, and like black people with black shirts, people with white shirts, and they're passing a basketball back and forth between the two basketballs, and each team was passing it to each other. And then at one point, a guy in a gorilla suit dances through the scene. Um, if you show that video and you ask people to count the number of passes, that when they watch the video, they get so focused on counting passes that they totally miss that a guy in a gorilla suit just danced through the, 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 the shot. Um, it's amazing. Most people actually miss the gorilla. This is something called inattentional blindness, where we get so focused on something that we lose sight of other things and can't see them. Well, the research shows that expertise in a specific domain doesn't compensate for inattentional blindness. So you can still, as an expert, get so focused on something that you miss something else entirely. And so this is from a research paper, this screenshot. This is a, a, um, a CT scan of a patient looking at them from the top down. So this is if you're taking like pictures of different layers of a person's body working your way top to bottom. This is where you're looking at their abdomen. And so you're seeing a cross section from the top down of their lungs, right? This is their abdomen. So you're seeing a cross section of their lungs by the, produced by the CT scan. So that's what image you're seeing right now. Well, they gave an exercise to these radiologists. So these are doctors who, st who like every day, they're looking at CT scans. And uh, they gave them a task. And they said, hey, we want you to look for a lung module, which is the thing next to the yellow ar arrow there. And they said, so we're going to give you these sets of CT scans. You want to look for lung modules. Well, the doctors were highly proficient at spotting lung modules. But in the process, they totally missed that the, next to the red arrow there, there's a breast mass that's probably cancerous. And the CT scan reveals that, but they totally missed that this person probably has breast cancer because they were told to look for lung modules. Now, if you tell them to look, in fact, two thirds of the radiologists who did this exercise looking for the lung module completely missed the, the, the breast mass. So they totally missed that this, that this person probably has breast cancer. 
two thirds of, but if you told them, hey, look for breast cancer, only 3% miss it. <laughs> and so, so you can see how inattentional blindness is a problem here because uh, when we get so focused on one task with our expertise, our expertise in other areas can diminish or go away. Now, this isn't just mastery about a topic. This is mastery about problems. And so I want to give in, I want to get into some principles about why problems are hard to master. Part of it is the way we talk about them. We often take a given set or category of problems and we just then describe it as a problem. So like clean water access is a problem. And, and so there's organizations that are working to get clean water to populations, water.org, water for people. These are examples of organizations that you've probably heard of that are trying to get clean water to more people around the globe. Well, here's the thing. If you treat water at clean water access as a problem, then you gloss over all of the hidden complexity that's there. The reality is that access to clean water is an uncountable number of problems. And let me illustrate what I mean. These are five different ways that water can be polluted and make it dangerous to drink. It can be bacterially polluted with lead, with parasites, with agricultural runoff, like, like uh, excess nutrients, uh, like, nitri like, like too much nitrogen or phosphorus from fertilizer, for example. Or you can get like oil byproducts, like if there's an oil spill. These are just five different ways of what are many ways, and here I've even lumped them into bigger categories, but five different ways that water can be polluted. There is no one technology that can, that can clean water with all five of these pollutants. There are some technologies that can handle multiples of them, so like uh, filters that can, uh, that can filter out things like bacterial or parasitic pollu pollutants. You know, they, usually one filter can do both of those things, but it might miss other things in the process. A filter could get totally clogged by oil, for example, and be worthless as a filter. So already you need different technological solutions depending on the nature of the water pollution. But context layers add to the complexity. And so I'm just going to add some context to show you what that means. We might have people that are living in urban areas versus rural areas versus remote areas that don't even really qualify as rural. You might have people living in conflict areas or people where, where there are climate issues like areas of drought. I want you to see how like any one of the, or even multiples of these of these contexts can apply at once to any or all of these situations where the water is polluted in a particular way. But we're not done. Let's add another layer. And here we get cultural and economic layers. And so we could have religion as a layer, gender as a layer, uh, gender like gender roles, uh, government and, and the nature of the government where the person is living, the way markets are operating, the income level of the people who need access to clean water. <clears throat> These are all additional layers of context that we can add to this clean water problem. Well, here's the thing. With just these 15 different layers of context and it, picking only one from each column, we already can generate 125 possible combinations. There is no one solution that can address all the combinations of just this little exercise I put on the slide. And obviously, if we added in all of the context layers, right, all the different ways that water can be polluted, all of the geographic um, like circumstances, all of the uh, all of the social or economic circumstances, like context that, that problems can occur in, we get way more than 125 possible combinations. We get an, un an uncountable number of possible combinations from one water problem to the next. And so we can't really describe access to clean water as a problem. It's a multitude of problems, an uncountable number of problems. And so if you want to help people get more access to clean water, you're going to have to develop a lot of sophisticated expertise that's going to be able to manage and navigate all of these uh, complex manifestations of one given problem. And if you think about it, this is true for pretty much all hard problems. All hard problems look like this. And the ones that get really hard, we've already learned about when we learned about wicked problems where they're so large and unique and socially complex and hard to explain, constantly changing, interacting variables, and impervious to simple solutions. Wicked problems are the product of that context layer process that we were just talking about. So with problems being as hard as they are, how do we develop mastery? Well, I'm going to give you guys some tools to get started with that. First of all, look for ways that rational behavior is helping the problem persist. A common mistake that people make when they confront a problem is they think it's stupid. And they think, man, this problem is so dumb. Why does this even exist? How come the people aren't making better choices? 
I guarantee you, if you have that attitude toward a problem that you're trying to help, you're going to get it wrong because pretty much every problem is sustained by rational behavior, meaning that the people involved who are experiencing or suffering from this problem, their decisions reflect the decisions any rational person would make in that situation. This is true even for addicts, and an economist named Gary Becker put forward a really controversial but interesting argument to say that even addictive behavior is rational if you understand the incentives properly. And so, and, and the example I use here is the tragedy of the commons, right? If all these idiots would just take the bus, I could be home by now. And so, you know, traffic overwhelming an interstate is an example of the tragedy of the commons. If this is a problem that's driven by rational behavior, the majority of problems are sustained by rational decision making. So you don't really gain mastery over a problem until you understand the rational behavior that's sustaining the problem. Look then for local expertise or local knowledge. Local knowledge is this really cool idea that was developed by an economist named Frederick Hayek. He was an Austrian economist, a free market economist, and he had this to say. He said, there is beyond question a body of very important but unorganized knowledge, which cannot possibly be called scientific in the sense of knowledge of general rules. This kind of knowledge of particular circumstances is of time and place. It's with respect to this that practically every individual has some advantage over all others because he possesses unique information of which, benefit, of which beneficial use might be made, but of which use can be made only if the decisions depending on it are left to him or are made with his active cooperation. So the, es the essential idea of, of local knowledge is that each of us in our circumstances understand our circumstances better than anybody else. We, 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 have it, we are immersed in our circumstances in such a way that there are things we understand that nobody else understands. And if our circumstances need to be improved or changed, then the more likely way to improve or change them is by incorporating my knowledge of my own circumstances. This is a really potent concept of local knowledge, and it's used all the time now in international development and other contexts, basically saying, hey, we can't just solve problems on our own. We have to co-create problems with the people who have local knowledge. And then another important tip in developing expertise around problems is to resist quick fixes. We have a tendency when we see problems to jump to a conclusion about what the fix is that needs to be implemented, then that first instinct is almost always wrong. <laughs> it's almost always wrong. But here's the problem with first instincts. When you first encounter a problem to be solved, that first idea that comes to mind often prevents a better solution from being discovered. This is, again, research that comes from chess, but also other contexts. You give a chess problem, like a chess puzzle, to an, ex to an expert chess player, and you can even watch their eyes and like scan their eye position to see what they're looking at. And the first, the first idea they had to solving the chess puzzle sticks in their brain and is really stubborn and hard to remove. Our first instinct in solving a problem is usually wrong, but that first instinct takes a, a, a sort of a premier position that requires effort to combat. I call this Swiss Army knife thinking. And the reason I call it that is because you may know people like this who've got like, you know, like a, um, like a Swiss Army knife or some other multi-tool like it. And their instinct when they confront a problem that they need a tool for is to pull out, is to grab their Swiss Army knife. Now, here's the thing about Swiss Army knives. It is true that they are handy in lots of different situations. It is also true that they are never the best tool for the situation. They are always subpar tools to a problem. What makes we, us have them is because they come with convenience. You can carry this in your pocket, so you have all these tools in your pocket, but all the tools you have are subpar tools. Let me illustrate what I mean. The arrow right now is pointing to the fish scaler tool. It's the one that also has a ruler printed on it, so it's got a double purpose of being a ruler to measure something, but those like scalloped, that scalloped edge right there is for scaling fish. Okay, so this is what a Swiss Army knife version of a fish scaler looks like. And you, the reason you want to get, like take the scale off of fish is so you can cook them and then, you know, the, and, and not have to eat fish scales, which are gross. So this is the Swiss Army knife version of a fish scaler. And if you are engaging Swiss Army knife thinking, you might come across a situation where you need to scale a, descale a fish and you'll pull out your Swiss Army knife and you use that tool. Now, do you want to see what a real fish scaler looks like? 
like the kind that like somebody who's scaling descaling fish all the time would actually use. This is the top rated fish scaler from Amazon. This is what it looks like. It looks nothing like the Swiss Army Knife version. <laughs> I mean, this is a totally different tool. It's built for the same purpose, but it doesn't have to struggle with the portability and convenience of being in a Swiss Army Knife. And so it has a big beefy handle on it. It has multiple ridges. You can see looking at this picture how much easier it would be, even if you've never scaled a fish before, and I gave you each of these tools, you'd pick the, the, the big robust version of it every time rather than the Swiss Army Knife version. Swiss Army Knife thinking gets us to pick quick fixes to problems and then we suffer from that Einstein effect where the first solution we come to, that comes to mind is the one that persists and makes it harder to find other solutions. So don't fall into this trap because if you do it's going to hinder your development of expertise. Instead, use good tools. And there are a lot of good tools for problem mastery. And this is a list of them. I won't go into them, but we can maybe explore them a little bit in class. And I can maybe share a document with you that gets into more detail on these. So how do you know if you've become a master? What does mastery look like? How do we identify a master? Um, you know, uh, Erickson's work says that you identify mastery based on comparing one person's performance against another's. You can tell the difference between Serena Williams playing tennis and me playing tennis, right? That's no, there's, it's easy to identify mastery there. But there are other things we can look to to identify mastery, especially in areas that are harder to discern it, like something easy like tennis or chess. People who have mastered problems can identify the beginning and the end of the problem. They understand the boundaries of it. They know where the problem starts and stops. They're good at making predictions, reliable guesses about the problem. And so like when the problem arises and what happens because of it are predictions you might make about a problem. And if you're doing those accuracy accurately, you probably have some mastery. You rarely encounter unexpected circumstances involving the problem. You're not often surprised when you encounter the problem. That indicates mastery. You can discern varieties of the problem. So like all the different clean water examples that I gave or polluted water examples I gave. An expert in this problem is going to be able to discern varieties of this problem that are more or less common. And then finally, if you're an expert, you can typically describe the problem accurately, but with multiple levels of complexity, meaning you could describe it accurately to a five-year-old just as much as you could describe it accurately to a PhD candidate who's researching that exact problem. Your level of complexity will vary depending on the audience, but along the way, you can always describe it accurately, but at varying levels of complexity. These are all indicators of mastery. Like if you've mastered a problem, you can do all of these things. Now, we can't always be in a situation where we have the expertise needed, um, so we might be called to help where we're lacking expertise, what then? Well, there are ways to help without expertise. Um, they're not as effective but as having expertise, but they're still helpful. One is generate hope. Uh, this isn't something that typically requires a lot of expertise. We talked about hope in a previous class session, but if you can find ways to generate hope, it works. Number two is you can recruit help. Go get the help of an expert. If you can't get help, then model an expert. Like try to do what an expert would do in your situation. You might ask for advice, for example, from an expert and then follow their advice. Another important thing is to just do the next right thing. You may not be able to solve the problem, but in the moment you can comfort the person because that's the next right thing to do. So you won't be solving the problem, but you can do something that's helpful. And then last and probably most importantly is let the helpie guide you. Rather than assuming what they need or ignoring what they've said they need, listen to them with what they say they need and let them guide you in helping them solve the problem. Oh, I just looked at the time and I went over again. I'm not going to re-record this to make it more compact. Hopefully you can just speed it up and I'll warn you all the uh, an announcement on campus again. When we get together in class, we're going to talk about water temples in Bali and how it illustrates the principles we've talked about here in this recording. We'll see you all then.